I said I'm really excited for Heavy Metal Queen. Oh, me too. I can't believe we got Melody Spivak. What? Melody Spivak, the voice of BT. I thought we were talking to my dad this week. What? My dad. Why would we have your dad on the podcast? Jamie, I'd love to talk to you about this, but you have to turn it down. What? The music. Turn it down. I'm not playing any music. What? Angela, what's going on with our sound? What? Angela, are you playing heavy metal? Yeah. It's the new intro music. I made it myself. Do you like it? Wow, it's really good. Yeah, I super love it. But also, please make it stop. Oh, right. Right. I'll, I'll workshop it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jamie Sanchez, and I'm way too chicken to drink a prairie oyster. I'm Lauren Fates, and I'm the daughter of a rock and roll loving truck driver. Are you ready for the beat? I'm ready for the beat. Welcome back, listeners, to the Bebop Beat. We're really excited to bring not one but two interviews uh, to the discussion of Heavy Metal Queen. But before we get to that, a little bit about how we've been spending time in quarantine. Lauren, did you know that I play Beat Saber? Uh, I didn't, but I've seen the DDR stuff in your basement, so I'm not surprised. Yeah, I'm kind of a rhythm game nut. <laughs> this, this, in this house, we play rhythm games. And I'm fortunate to have a VR setup in the basement so that I can download and play a whole bunch of different Beat Saber charts. For the uninitiated, Beat Saber is a VR game in which you wield two lightsabers and you cut blocks to the rhythm of a song. The songs tend to be like a minute to four minutes, depending. Uh, but there's this huge community, and this is true of a lot of rhythm games, of custom mappers, as they're called in Beat Saber. You, you make custom maps. So much like Rock Band, these charts need to be written by someone with all the notes. And I was like, okay, well, the fandom loves lots of things, and they also love Bebop, so there's got to be a tank version of Beat Saber out there, right? So I downloaded it, and it turns out it's really good. <laughs> There's uh, one of a remix of Tank. I downloaded the original TV intro. What's really cute about it is that the mapper actually took the time and effort to like color code the backgrounds. It's really fun. So it looks like the intro color openings, like when Faye has, you know, a big, vibrant pink background, the background in this rhythm game is pink. I love it. It's so cute. It sounds like a lot of love was put into it. I haven't been playing any Cowboy Bebop related video games. My partner and I just started playing Don't Starve Together, which is not new by any means. Uh, but I do have a tank related confession if you'd like to hear it. Please. I am officially fast forwarding through the theme song as we watch the episodes. I've gotten to the point where I can't sit through the whole thing anymore. It is the greatest <laughs> anime opening of all time and I'm fast forwarding. Oh, well, you know what? Uh, I would also say my partner today actually was like, hey, could we not anymore? Well, especially because it's apparently playing around your house during video games as well. <laughs> <laughs> Straight into my ears, at least. <laughs> but you are absolutely right. We have a jam-packed episode to get through. Very cool guests, lots of content. I would say I did the most research I've ever done so far in just trying to deep dive into some stuff that came up during the episode. Uh, but for our friends following at home, I'll just start summarizing. So Heavy Metal Queen opens with a type of music we have never heard before on the show. We see these trucks, which to me look more like trains. They're navigating past billboards. They're dropping off cargo. And we meet the iconic VT. She is a trucker. She's infamous. Her shift is over. And she's checking out of her shift with her cat. Did I get it right that her cat's name is Zeros, like the number zero plural? Correct, yes. So she has a cat named Zeros, and just as she's about to end her work shift, her coworker Otto says he wants to guess her name. VT carries around a pile of cash. 
hoping, uh, well, not necessarily hoping if, if she wants to keep the money, but the deal is if someone can guess what VT stands for, they get the pile. And if they can't guess it, another hundred wulongs or so goes into the pot. Uh, Otto doesn't guess it. VT rides again. And uh, it's kind of a Chekhov's gun, right? I think immediately I was wondering who on our crew is going to end up guessing her name. And we get there. I think revisiting this episode was probably my favorite so far. This this entire episode just mired in comedy. It's, I would say, the writer's best comedy episode to date. We start at Max Diner. It's loaded with these really rowdy bounty hunters who are there to catch a bounty known as Decker. We know that Decker is has a dragon tattoo on his arm. And Faye somehow gets the tip that he may be at another location called Woody's. And Woody's is just the place I don't want to be. <laughs> like, Why not? It, Chuck E. Cheese. Have you been to a modern Chuck E. Cheese in recent years? Like, I cannot stand that atmosphere. <laughs> I don't know how recent you would say recent is. I guess my answer is no. But I did go there in college a couple of times, ironically, and I still liked it. But I was more uh, saddened, you know, because they serve beer there and you see like parents eating pizza and drinking beer <laughs> while, like, kids, while, while their kids wreak havoc. But I don't mind it. The games are fun. It's a lot. It's a lot to take in. So it's really funny to see Faye in this situation and spotting someone who she believes is Decker. But turns out it's just a man who has a love of eels. I did take note that the mascots at uh, the Chuck E. Cheese, or Woody's if you will, were named Mackie and Manny, which is just a Mickey and Minnie ripoff. So it's a Disney thing as opposed to Chuck E. Cheese, and that's cute. Anyway, it takes a bit in this episode, but when we're introduced to Spike... He is in a bad way. He is like <laughs> literally pants down, hairy legs on the toilet of the bar with a hangover. The size of Neptune. Hangover the size of Neptune. And I wrote down in my notes just for you, nerd for eggs, because <laughs> his cure for this hangover is going to be a prairie oyster. There is a YouTube video that I found while digging around for this episode. It's called How to Dr the channel is called How to Drink and they do a Cowboy Bebop episode. The first drink that YouTube video covers is a prairie oyster. Prairie oyster includes a raw egg. How do you say this word? Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> Worcester sauce. Anyway, Vinegar and or hot sauce, table salt, and ground black pepper. Sometimes tomato juice is added, but not here. Spike is basically just sprinkling stuff onto an egg. Or at least he wants to. He is interrupted by the bad boy bounty hunters who are harassing waitresses and making kind of a stink. An interesting observation that I see is in both of our notes is that bounty hunters at large seem to be quite different from our heroes. Jamie, would you agree? I would. It's unfortunate, the portrayal there, the the idea that all bounty hunters are riffraff and they're just ready to, I don't know, be very sexist stereotypes in some way. And I, they're unsavory characters for the most part. And I think that's true of every bounty hunter we've met that wasn't the Bebop crew. We do also get to see our trio of old guys who are just recurring characters in the episode, they show up at the bar too. So it's a popular bar. I'd like to point out that Spike's introduction is, you spilled my egg, I needed that egg. And then he just goes to town with the badass fight scene. <laughs> VT is impressed with him for a short time but then discovers he's a bounty hunter and doesn't want anything to do with him. VT's feeling on bounty hunters is that they gamble with human lives and she's not interested in getting wrapped up in the adventure. She does, though, eventually. So all of this action takes place on location at what we presume is some kind of pit stop or space oasis. They don't necessarily pin this to any planet. 
uh, or city on a planet. So that's pretty interesting, the interplay between, um, you know, at Max Steiner, we're in a a very Earth-similar gravity, uh, but in the parking lot, so to speak, there's a lighter gravity threshold, and we have uh, different juxtapositions of camera angles. And I really appreciated this, where VT and Otto are introduced, and they are on different planes, like Otto's on the ceiling, so to speak, and he turns off his gravity boots and comes to her. Yeah, the episode ends that way, too, which I think is really cool, and also, I think, sets us up, maybe, for the high-action climax of the episode when Spike sort of floats out in space. It sets us up for the idea that we're going to be playing in three dimensions a little bit, which is very cool for a 2D show. The other thing I caught during this first half of the episode is that there's a familiarity between Muriel and Spike that seems to be there already. So you can maybe infer that Spike and, at least Spike and Jet have been to this location before and they've been to Max Diner. I don't know if Faye has been to Woody's before, but (laughs) that parfait looks awful good. I did feel a little bad for Muriel because they really paint her as this dumb blonde. She says, the something brothers, and I did tell you, I told you just now. She's framed as sort of this lovable ditz, but I feel like Cowboy Bebop already was doing dumb blonde sometimes with Judy. Uh, (laughs) I would like to, you know, spare some poor woman the stereotype, but I still, I still liked her as a character, um... And to your point, I like the relationships between the people in this bar because they all know VT as well. And Muriel, when she's getting hit on, is really willing to like run behind VT and trust VT as a protector. It does a lot of character building for VT, even when VT herself is not doing the talking. And this episode really leans into those themes of community and familiarity uh, in addition to like bounty hunter fame and the norms that come with it. So there, there's a lot of established world already here for the, the watcher to dive into. And I feel like in some ways they do bring in new content, but not in the way that they had to for all the heavy lifting at the start of the show. This is very established. You're supposed to get a sense that, okay, this pit stop has been you know, frequently visited. There's a a hominess to it, you know, cheers where everybody knows your name, that kind of thing. And so when these bounty hunters out of nowhere come on the scene, it's like, oh, who are all these strangers? Who are these others who are making this place, which is usually comfortable, very, what, low life bounty hunter scum? (laughs) I like that point that it is a community gathering place because it implies that When Spike feels like garbage, this is a place he feels safe or comfortable going. To your point about Faye, I don't think Faye necessarily feels safe or comfortable at Woody's, but she is enjoying the ice cream. She has no problem crawling all over the booth in a sexual manner in front of children, though, to get the bounty. So I don't (laughs) think she's trying to fit in. She is not in disguise in any way. I didn't realize, and I guess I should have, that uh, Decker and the name Woody's is a Woody Allen reference, and it makes his presence at Woody's extremely creepy. Oh, it sure does. (laughs) I didn't necessarily want to go there, but we did, and we're here, (laughs) and it happened. (laughs) Well, I don't want to get called out for not catching it either, but Woody Allen, infamous for relationships with women who are too young for him, and... This is not a podcast about that, but someone on the team sure knew about that pop culture problem, and we had it laid out before us. (laughs) Yikes. I'm glad he dies. (laughs) So it's really funny here that we get introduced to Decker, and his whole thing is the truck full of nitro. Right. He he kind of plays the part of a trucker in this one. He supposedly has enough experience to haul a big load around, especially through the Linus mines or to try to outmaneuver VT. But also, I appreciate how they they really undermine the idea that like, oh, this bounty, you know, he's going to be big bad. And it turns out like, no, he's just some scrawny dude who (laughs) who's just really good at blowing things up. 
Yeah, I didn't necessarily get that he was a super skilled trucker. When he went into the Linus mines, I was more like, well, that guy's boned. He obviously isn't going to be able to handle this. Uh, But maybe you're right. Maybe he has a background in it. His truck is highly decorated. It's elaborate, and it is what eventually helps our heroes find him. So this must not be his first rodeo. You mentioned the eel tattoo, on the guy who is not our bounty. I looked that up. I couldn't find anything about that character being a reference. Uh, there is an eight-eyed eel in like Final Fantasy fourteen, but there's not any lore or anything I could find. However, the goddess on Decker's truck is a legit thing. Uh, Sarasvati is the Hindu goddess of art, learning, speech, and music. And that's a choice for Decker, I would say. (laughs) Yeah. He's sending a message. Yeah, well, it's fun to have that uh, in an episode that is so much about music. We meet a lot of other truckers in this episode as well. Uh, VT initially doesn't want to get involved with the bounty hunters, but then Otto is involved in a hit and run with Decker, and suddenly it becomes personal, and she wants to track him down. I know that you have some really cool stuff to say about why these truckers look so quirky. So there's a very small but fervent Japanese subculture known as Dekotora, which is like decorated truck. And the idea here is that well, if you're going to be a long haul trucker, you might as well make the most of your ride. <laughs> and so these these truckers, they put LEDs on them. They they go all to town and they're just very extravagantly decorated, you know, giant heavy trucks. It also turns out that this subculture is highly influenced by the art of Gundam since the late 1990s. So I'm actually not surprised that Dekotora has a representation in Cowboy Bebop, given the number of people who worked on Gundam also work on this show. And one of the truckers, at least one of them, if not two, have sort of a fandom thing going on. So here's my run through of who we meet. We have VT. VT's truck is customized with old license plates. Uh, I love that because my dad kept all of his old license plates in his garage. So I kind of know what that nostalgia feels like. We have Love Machine who has neon lights all over the front of his truck and the side says Moon Angel. I paused the episode when we could see the very front of his truck because I wanted to see what the neon lights were and their names of women like Yoko, Ayumi, uh, Ryoko. And I'm kind of wondering if maybe Moon Angel is supposed to be some sort of girl band and maybe he's a huge fan. If not, maybe those are the names of his kids or something. But either way, inside of his truck uh, are a ton of plushies, the kind that I would think you'd get out of one of those like claw grabber machines. I could totally see a guy at a truck stop just collecting those. If you're familiar with modern day otaku and people who identify as otaku in Japan, this is actually not outside the norm. There's a lot of fervent fans out there who believe that the more you buy and the more you display, it it just shows your level, your power level for your love of thing. So, um, girl He's bands, very powerful. Yeah, <laughs> idol bands. I mean, this is a, a very apt analogy to idol bands. You see this a lot. There's there's this wild. Okay, getting off track because this is so fascinating. There is a group of anime fans who will collect different things like keychains and plushies and covers for uh, body pillows and that, and they will craft entire suits of armor out of them with wingspans of up to like six feet wide. I'm not kidding. And it is wild. (laughs) So this, this Dekotora application seems in line with that kind of fandom. Maybe maybe at home, Love Machine has one of those suits of his own. Pretty likely, I would say. <laughs> we also have Sneaky Snake. His truck is full of what I think are a lot of like Japanese sort of symbols of good fortune and luck. I would love to know from our listeners. And finally, we have Spider Mike, the Black Panther of Jupiter, 
who's uh, got a lot of vices, I guess, inside of his truck. Plants, booze, such as Koruba, Gordon's, uh, and then guns, just guns and ammunition around. And he's the one who saw Decker. The other thing that's really fun about Spider Mike is he's the one hauling all of the cargo that says Chicago on it. (laughs) Here's the thing. The trucks that say Chicago say Chicago since 1941. 1941 is not when Chicago was founded. Maybe it's when the company was founded, but I'm trying my damnedest to make some sort of connection to Chicago, Illinois, Japan. (laughs) Was 1941 when that happened? I don't know. (laughs) I'll lean into it. (laughs) So we did not mention that Terpscore is actually also a thing. Terpscore is the muse of dancing, according to Greek mythology, and is one of the nine muses. So I guess Terpscore and Sarasvati could hang out together is what I'm hearing. They would probably get along. I don't think that's like sacrilegious to say. So here on the Bebop Beat, you know that we love to talk to experts, especially experts who have lifestyles or hobbies or careers that we ourselves would like to know more about. Uh, Fun fact about me, I said it in the title, I'm the daughter of a truck driver. And as a fun treat, (laughs) we decided to bring my dad, onto the podcast. So uh, I would like to introduce you all to Bob Rapsiak. Hi, Dad. It's so good to see you. Pleased to meet you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. (laughs) Well, pleased to meet Jamie. You've known me my whole life. (laughs) (laughs) Jamie and all the rest. Pleased to meet you. So uh, you are not an anime fan. You're not a Cowboy Bebop fan. You have no idea why you're here. Uh, (laughs) But you have a lifetime of truck driving experience. And today's episode of Cowboy Bebop was all about truck driving. So we wanted to ask you what it was like to be a truck driver. Why did you decide to be one? Well, I'll tell you. I worked my first few jobs right after high school in factories. I worked at Xerox Corporation for five years assembling copying machines. And then three years after that, I was a printer and I got tired of working indoors. And uh, I started being a parts driver for a Ford truck dealer in Lyons, Illinois. And after 10 years of doing that, then I joined a reg- uh, got a job at a regular trucking company delivering general freight. So uh, that's how that kind of started. So I know there are different ways to be a truck driver. So for example, you came home every night, but not everyone does that, right? Correct. I was a city pickup and delivery driver, meaning you go out with a truckload of deliveries and then you get your dispatch. When you're empty, you call dispatch and then they uh, send you to half a dozen or so uh, places, load the truck back up and bring that in. And that freight comes off of your truck and cross docks to either uh, over the road line or some of it goes to a rail, you know, rail cars. With, and we had rail access. So that that's that happened every day. So I was I was home every day. So does this mean that the trucks are interchangeable or did you have your own truck that you would be able to access every day for your deliveries? I was uh, assigned one. Yes. So did you get a chance to personalize it in any way? <laughs> well, not exactly. The The only real personalization was, uh, you know, the ones that had a radio and a CD player, I got to bring my own music. And uh, actually, uh, no, it had the company logo and everything. And uh, you got to put a seat cover on it or maybe a nice steering wheel cover, but no real, not the company trucks, no. <laughs> no, they, they weren't customized. Well, it's funny that you mentioned music because the truck driver character on Cowboy Bebop this week listens to heavy metal. Uh, What kind of music did you listen to in your truck? Well, being that uh, I'm a baby boomer, I listened to Led Zeppelin, The Stones, uh, various type of music, The Beatles. uh, And later on, I got some country, but 
mainly it was rock and uh, things like that. And even a little bit of disco. (laughs) 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 And my arm hanging out the window as much as possible. (laughs) So what was the community like with other drivers? I remember being in the truck once on take your daughter to work day and there were guys talking over the radio. So how did you all treat each other? Were there code names and stuff like that? Well, seeing as I was a city driver and and a a company driver, our radios were affixed to our main base and to our other drivers in our company. And uh, it was generally a little, some silly things like, uh, you know, Hey, I'm going into such and such neighborhood. Where's the best gyro today? Or, you know, mm-hmm. uh, where's the best place to hide and pull over? But we'd have a, we, we, when we wanted to talk like that, we'd switch over to another channel so the dispatch wouldn't hear us. <laughs> <laughs> we'd do things like that. <laughs> but uh, between each other, you know, it was always pretty much fun. That's, you know, and then the dispatch, you know, talking to the dispatch, well, it was just getting your next assignment and whatnot. That's all. In your line of work, did you ever meet any strange or extreme truckers who were like really into it? Um, once in a while, yeah, I'm, I'm gathering you're talking about over the road guys who live five, six days a week in there. And uh, once in a while going into a truck stop, uh, you know, when we had a, a long delivery, like say from Chicago to Rockford or something, it's not that long, but you would pull into a, rest stop or something to go to the bathroom, get a bottle of pop. And there'd be some real scruffy, smelly guys. And <laughs> most of them were pretty friendly, but I mean, Oh man, the stench of some of these. Oh, no. <laughs> but all in all, they're pretty friendly. So <laughs> you, you had to deliver to companies and yes. I know that you develop a rapport with some of them. Yes. Visiting them often. How were you treated as sort of an outsider coming into these companies? Were the people nice? Uh, generally, yes. Yes. It's like, you know, Lauren might chuckle, but, uh, you know, if you got, you go in a place with a good attitude and, and uh, they'll give you a good attitude. You come in saying, well, how soon can you unload me? Well, then they're going to, you know, the dock men would treat you well, wait your turn. But if you, you know, said good morning and this and that, you're next. Or if you had a cup of coffee in your hand, oh, thank you very much. You're next, you know, things like that. (laughs) And uh, what really got me going with uh, many customers over the years was I got to know a lot of people and I knew when there were holidays and when the buffet lunches were out, you know, I I time lunches and all they'd always invite me in for food and beverages and stuff. And uh, always pretty good. With your regulars, as long as you said good morning and this and that, it was pretty good. Have you ever run into any trouble or hazards at work? Uh, yes. When uh, when I have, you know, generally our warehouse would deliver uh, paper to printing companies. And you have anything from boxes of copying machine paper to gigantic rolls that they, you would see on web presses at newspaper companies and stuff. Well, I had a load of those one time and the uh, fork truck wouldn't fit on the truck to let the rolls down and out the back. So I had to use uh, a special lever to drop them down to the floor and push them out the back. Well, one of the times the uh, roll slipped and it pinned me up against the inside of the truck and it broke, it kind of, messed my knee and my lower part of my right leg up. And I had a torn uh, ACL and a meniscus tear. And I was off of work for five months. And uh, that's what happened, you know. But that was just one of the things. I mean, uh, you had to watch for grease on the floor, you know, because the forklifts were always leaking or something. And when you're walking to and from your truck, when you go on other people's docks and other companies, you had to watch for spillages and things and uh, some people wouldn't let you go past they'd make you stand right there at the back of your truck you know but uh, that was for safety concerns but if they knew you hey the coffee machine's over here the lunchroom's over there help yourself (laughs) go anywhere you want that was some of the fun parts of it how do you get rest or relax in your truck or is it just with the day deliveries that it's you don't have that kind of time um 
being a local carter driver, you have multiple stops per day. So you're going uh, to this place and to that place. And uh, when you have, if you're, if you feel you're getting a little ahead of schedule, well, you, you pull over somewhere I'm, and you think to yourself, well, I'm getting done a little bit too quick. And everybody does this. So you <laughs> take like an extra 10 or 15 minutes, get a Coke or something. That's a, uh... Kind of brings it back to the beginning of our talk here. Yes. It seems like you had a lot of freedom, and that's yes. what you were looking for at work. Yes, yes. Uh, being away from a printing machine or the assembly line at Xerox, I mean, being out like that, you can you can step it up without you know getting stepping anybody's toes, or you can lag behind a little bit to your benefit. You know, you can do it towards the company or towards yourself, and uh, it'll all even out where you were appreciated as long as you got the job done and didn't crash the truck. <laughs> <laughs> so in the anime episode we're talking about today, yeah. uh, nobody drinks on the job and you never did either. No, I did not. <laughs> but no. uh, VT, the truck driver, goes to a bar after she's done working. So I know this is a favorite topic of yours. Okay. What, what is your favorite drink? It's probably between a, a good Bloody Mary or a good uh, rum and Coke. I, I'm not too too crazy about real specialty drinks, but a, a decent Bloody Mary or a good rum and Coke, you know, with a good rum. There's a there's a drink in this episode called a prairie oyster, and it has a raw egg in it. Have you ever had anything like that? <laughs> what was presented to us multiple, not on the job. Now, this was just, uh, you know, with friends. When we used to uh, get together at a VFW lounge in Berwyn, uh, they would put a raw egg in a glass of beer and see you oh. can chug it. I tried it once <laughs> and it was, you know, it wasn't awful as long as you didn't burst the, you know, the thing. If you could swallow the yolk, then you're in good shape. But I only tried it once. Uh, no, thank you. No, I, yeah, that, that once was enough with that. <laughs> Uh, I know Jamie had a question and we were deciding whether or not to ask it, but in a, the science fiction future, in a fantasy world, do you think it would be fun to be a trucker in outer space? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Um, I didn't think you would. Because <laughs> I, I wouldn't be in a, you, you wouldn't be in a truck. You'd be in a rocket ship or a special jet or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you have to go from planet to planet. <laughs> that would be your stops, unless unless you had a, a, a space station, you know, and you'd pull into one of them. Otherwise, it'd have to be, you know, a planet. But I think it would be interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's what this episode is about. I just wanted to make you smile. Uh, but that's oh, all yeah, we have. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us, Dad. You have taught us a lot about being a truck driver. We really <laughs> appreciate you being on the show. This was really fun. Yeah, it was Thank nice you. to meet you, Bob. <laughs> nice to meet you, Jamie. And uh, I, you know, I, I was being honest with you about most of the stuff, and uh, I, most I never of it. lied about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my dad. <laughs> Bob, so kind. Thank you. <laughs> the most wholesome of all podcasts. Thank you, Dad. It was amazing to have you on. We hope you share this with all of your friends. I really feel like I got a good understanding now of like the the challenges of being a driver. It's not just about taking the load somewhere. It's also making sure it's properly docked and unloaded. Yeah, he said a lot about relationships that I really appreciated and how being a kind person can actually be to your advantage. And I think VT is a good person as well. But also the story of injury is pretty horrific and I think actually makes some of the final scenes of this episode feel really real. Mm -hmm, for sure. So before we dive into the latter half of the episode, we do get introduced to another Cowboy Bebop character who's really important to the episode, but has no real presence in it. BT's husband, Earl Terpsgray. The writers of the show took the time and effort to create an entire backstory from him, and it only exists online in the web archives right now. This was a piece that was a short story written in the style of a blog almost, 
uh, and it was attached to the Knocking on Heaven's Door movie marketing website. So this is the only place where you can experience Earl or UT's history uh, beyond VT's presence in this episode. You showed this to me, and it was another time where I was like, you're making this up. This can't be true. Because it is extremely Star Wars-y, like how the movie Solo exists. I don't know who was asking to have these questions answered, because it's not just his story. It's his story before he even became a bounty hunter. So we don't learn stuff from the episode that maybe we'd want to know. Like, we don't learn how he died or what his relationship with VT was like. It's just, like, heavy prequel stuff. And you can still see it online. You even learn the name of his ex, which is just kind of like, what? <laughs> this is before VT's even in the picture. So, it yeah, it, it goes to show that Bebop has legs beyond just the Bebop crew. And I wish we got more of that backstory or more of that world in other ways, which I think we'll touch on in later episodes. One way we could learn more about VT is by researching what she is into. And she had a line that really struck me where Faye is screaming above the music and VT says, it's not repulsive, it's very soothing. Uh, Heavy metal is not really my cup of tea, but I've heard through just like anecdotally through my friends that the people who like it really get something out of it. And so I just wanted to see if there were any actual studies, if there's any real science to back that up. And in fact, studies do show that extreme music genres, including heavy metal, can reduce negative emotions and can reduce the stress hormone cortisol. There's a strong community surrounding heavy metal, much like the trucker community. It gives people a sense of belonging. And psychology today draws parallels between sophisticated classical music and intense music listeners. Apparently, both of these types of people are curious, creative, welcoming of new perspectives, and often politically liberal. Cognition Today also noted that some studies in the past have shown that heavy metal was harmful. For example, mice exposed to heavy metal began hurting each other. But the unease that people feel when they hear this music is strictly for non-fans, like Faye Valentine. Fans of heavy metal music, people who really like it, study after study shows that it is, in fact, soothing and healing. And I just love that. VT also uses this moment, uh, particularly when Faye is trying to grab the explosive from the truck cargo to essentially do a when in Rome moment. It's like, hey, you know, what's the worst that can happen? We could all just die here or you can lean into it and go with the flow. And I really appreciate that sentiment this episode. Um, in the dub, I don't know if you caught it, Faye calls it repulsive, but in the sub, it's called shit loud. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, hey, Faye, lean into this shit loud, <laughs> heavy metal, just get into the groove. Everything will work out somehow until it doesn't. And that seems to be the bounty hunter way. It does seem like that. I agree. And it makes sense why earlier in her life, maybe VT did fall in love with a bounty hunter because the decent, I mean, decent as far as a bounty hunter can go, the decent bounty hunters are people she actually seems to find common ground with. In an effort to really understand VT and find more common ground, we tracked down an expert, and we are so thrilled to introduce our second guest of the day, the voice of VT herself, Melody M. Spivak. Beyond Bebop, you may have encountered Melody's wide range of acting talents and works such as Ergo Proxy, World of Warcraft, and The Mask. Thank you so much for joining us today, Melody. It's my pleasure, absolutely. Melody, uh, I'm not sure if I got to tell you this before we started talking to you, but the other guest on the show this week is my own dad, who is a truck driver. <laughs> and he was he was super honored to hear that he'd be appearing in an episode with with the voice of of the anime. So thank you for being here with us. Oh, dad. Well, you can call yourself heavy metal king. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, Melody, uh, I would like to go back to a discussion we started having off mic just about the fact that before you ever heard of VT, you hadn't heard of anime either. So tell us a little bit about how the voice acting world and all of your friends discovered anime. Well, the voice acting world in those days was considerably different than it is today. Uh, especially where dubbing is concerned. There were projects coming in from Europe. There were projects coming in from Asia. There was no real structure to it. And basically, whatever the project was is what you did. Uh, It was a kind of a weird minestrone soup of projects that came down the pike. And this weird Japanese stuff started to float into that soup and float to the surface of that soup. And uh, we were trying to work in it and make sense of it and understand it because, to be honest, if you've never seen it before, it is a little different. So we are working on these projects and getting our feet wet and trying to come to terms with it. And uh, we're saying, you're not sure it's going to go anywhere, but it's a job and we'll do it. (laughs) So we're working in it. And then you start reading, and the word jumps out at you. And the first question is, great. Okay, what in the heck is anime? (laughs) (laughs) I've been asking myself that for the last 25 years. (laughs) So what is anime? You're still not sure, even though you've been working in it, because there have been so many different variations on the theme that have already come down the pike. And then enter a strange character named Carl Masick, who really started a lot of it. And he brought his projects over, he changed them up, he put them out there, and there you go. Uh, One of the jobs I'm most proud of was his project, Fist of the North Star. Yeah. And I was actually given a role like Julia. I don't get those very often. I mean, listen to these pipes. A lot of my voice actress friends have those marvelous heroic girl (laughs) pipes. I don't. I get the badasses and I get the villains and I I love that. That's absolutely terrific. But Carl trusted me with a role like Julia. Anyway, that's how it started. And the rest is history. That's amazing. Uh, But as anyone who's read your resume knows, you aren't just a voice actor. Uh, You have been a stunt person, a producer, a voice director. You've even done makeup. So in your opinion, from your point of view, how did your career evolve in so many different directions? Well, I'm a firm believer that if you're going to become an actor of any kind, first be that actor. Do theater and get your training. I did go through my training. I went to the American Academy. I trained in England. I did theater, I did Shakespeare, I did all of that stuff. And in fact, doing classical theater led to my first job in voice acting. Because I did a play, it was a classical play, with Tom Weiner, who gave me my first voice acting job. So you want to be an actor, and in the course of the classical training, I learned sword fighting. And in the course of being in L.A., I ended up in a show called The Adventures of Conan, a sword and sorcery spectacular I was Red Sonia. And in the course of doing that show, I met quite a few stunt people, including a stunt person who became a stunt coordinator, hello, Tom Morga, who gave me my first job on The Scarecrow and Mrs. King. So I was a physical actor to begin with, and a classical actor and a theater actor and somebody who really enjoyed having a live audience around you know, to, to feed back the energy. That that led to being in a genre where you have really anything but feedback from an audience. (laughs) Now, uh, about being an associate producer was because I got involved with an organization called The Silent Network, which did programming for deaf and hearing impaired audiences. And I was associate producer on a show called, and you're going to love this, VT would love it, a show called Here, H-E-A-R, Kitty Kitty. (laughs) Here, Kitty Kitty. And the person who was doing the spokes lady on this was, in fact, a deaf actress who could just sign. So it was a different world. I had to do a lot of research for that, a lot of writing, and a lot of the other things that an associate producer would do on a series of that nature. So on a show like that, um, if you look at the word 
AP, associate producer, and you flip the initials, you get PA, production assistant. And <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, you're a little bit of both on that. <laughs> anyway, that's how that evolved. And anything you do in the business leads you to something else in the business. Which is why actors rarely turn down work within the business, regardless of what aspect of the business it represents. Because you'll meet people, you'll move on to other things, people will help you out, get you another job. It all ties together. So your connections with the industry and folks from a lot of different aspects of it uh, landed you auditions in anime. What was the audition process like? Did they approach you knowing that you'd be great for these roles or did you have competition among your peers? I would say both. In some of the early ones particularly, it was absolutely auditioning because I was an unknown factor. And a lot of new actors, like I was at the time, despite their experience elsewhere, come into a studio, see a screen and a microphone, and they freeze right up. That microphone, it's like a cobra. <laughs> you know, it's staring at you. It's just a different type of performance. Later, when I became a known quantity, I was often just brought in, usually by the director who was... One of the other actors. The other actors were people that we'd all come up with back in the days when the dinosaurs roamed, and uh, we all knew what we were strong at. VT was one of those. I don't recall auditioning for VT. I, I really don't think I did, because I was always known for doing androgynous-type roles, non-gender-specific, um, and you can tell by the pipes. It's the sort of thing where, you know, is that a guy, is that a girl? And in cases where you're really not supposed to be sure, uh, I can even drop down a little lower and a little gruffer, and then you get into the, well, what the heck is that? <laughs> and because of that, a lot of those roles did come my way, yeah. So what else would you say you have in common with VT? We know you like cats. Uh, do you like driving, heavy metal? How do you relate to this character? Well, actually, VT and I part company on music. <laughs> I'm more the Renaissance, Celtic, medieval, new agey kind of music. And uh, heavy metal? Well, oh, not so much. <laughs> but I appreciate it in her. But cats? Oh, absolutely. We have that in common. I've had many cats through the years. And the cat I have now, I actually sent you a picture of her. Diva is really not dissimilar to Zero's. She's got a fluffy tail, and she's a rescue from the mean streets of L.A. You mentioned off mic that recording anime doves is a solo endeavor. You often don't get a chance to see who you're talking to and where the, the actual recorded content gets placed in the episode. But do you have any memorable moments about recording her? Or do you remember what it was like in the booth at the time? Well, yes, to some extent. For a start, she is well within my vocal range. So we didn't have to do what you occasionally have to do with other characters. Experiment. Especially a new character to a series. And try different vocal ranges and try different approaches before you lock down one that everybody's happy with and then go from there. She flowed very, very naturally from my own um, timbre, my own vocal range, and, well, attitude. <laughs> I mean, she definitely had attitude and rrr, I like that in a character. <laughs> yeah, that comes across very clearly on rewatch. Uh, I just remembered like enjoying VT's character all over again. And I wish there was more of her throughout the series, honestly. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I actually thought she would come back. I thought she was enough of a fantastic, enough of a, a wild card that she would come back to add some spice to what else was being done in the series. But unfortunately, no. Too bad. It is too bad. Elsewhere in this episode of the podcast, we talk about how there is canon fiction written about VT's husband, her late husband, and his life before ever meeting VT. And I was like, I don't want to read this. I don't even care about that guy. I want more VT stories. If you run into anybody who's writing stuff about VT, well, I would be interested myself. I think she has a heck of a backstory. She's really a very complicated character for a one-episode wonder. 
I think she could have been a spinoff all on her own. I feel that way about a lot of Bebop's one-off characters. They really give them sort of entire little worlds to live in. And I, as a fan, am left wanting more very often. Uh, What do you think people still like about Cowboy Bebop? Or why are people still talking about it this many decades later? I think a lot of it has to do with just, well, the feel of the thing. And like any project which is set in space, of which I am a very great fan, I love anything to do with science fiction, space, and the future of humanity. I think just knowing that people made it that far. To be honest, the Bebop universe isn't nearly as expansive and as huge as things like Star Trek and whatever made it later. To be fair, even Star Trek started fairly small and expanded. Anything in the science fiction universe projected into our future and showing that we do make it to space. You know, we are still flawed humans, and oh boy, are we ever. We made it that far, and we're going further. It gives us hope that that may actually occur, that we really won't blow ourselves up. Or poison ourselves or destroy the earth. (laughs) We're actually going to make it. We're actually going to be a significant factor in galactic terms, not just our own. I think that really, really resonates to a chord inside every good human being who feels that we can make it out there and have a future and still have magic ahead of us. That's a beautiful insight. I'm going to take that in my rewatch for the show going forward. Um, So you're clearly inspired by the sci-fi aspects of Cowboy Bebop, but what other standout shows inspire you as an actress or even just as a fan? Well, there were many through the years. I mentioned Star Trek and, oh yes, I was fortunate enough to come up in the years when classic Trek was first making its appearance. And it was amazing because there is a lot of, you know, sorry, bad sci-fi out there. But that came along, and even with the fact that it had no real budget, and it had the cheesy backgrounds, and it had, well, Christmas tree lights, and whatever else they could find, and some of the things they had as props, (laughs) they were straight out of a thrift store. And even despite that, the actors and writers, and bless you, Gene Roddenberry, managed to convey that, again, humanity had a future. That, yes, we're still flawed. Yes, we still have problems, but we can rise above them. That we have more potential than you could possibly imagine. And that drew us all in. My whole generation went nuts for that. Because what people forget is that as cheesy as it was, and sorry guys, it was, it had (laughs) never been done before. It had never been seen before. Nobody had ever taken that kind of a risk before. Three seasons of one series changed the world. It really did. And that stayed with me. I've been a fan of sci-fi Ever since. The whole thing, I mean, the whole genre, it speaks to me in a way that few other things really do. Oh, so good. I had another adventure. It was incredible, the most remarkable experience, both as a voice actor and as a fan. I was privileged to be working, looping on Alien Resurrection. I was a great fan of the first two Alien films. The second two, a little bit less. But the first two were (laughs) kicking. But... What an experience it was to be on Alien Resurrection. And they actually had a moment where they had to replace some of Sigourney Weaver's performance. Uh, She wasn't there, she wasn't available, or what have you. So they took three or four of us forward, and they asked us to do what we call a voice match, where they see who can get closest to her voice, and they picked me. And after that, I was in the back with all the other actors, because looping is done as a group endeavor. And they would show the next scene coming up on the screen, and they would say, okay, for this scene, we need you, 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 and they'd point to a few people, and then they'd point to me and say, Ripley, you're on deck. They called me 
Ripley. <laughs> I just turned it to absolute goo. I, I, had, I completely melted down, but of course I had to stand there and look terribly professional. <laughs> I got to voice match Sigourney Weaver. I mean, if you're a fan, and I am, that is gold. That is a moment that you, you, you'll take it to your grave. I can just see it carved on my tombstone. Yes, but once they called me Ripley. <laughs> And I can remember a couple of other really fun moments in the genre. I actually did get to direct some of the classic cast of Star Trek on a few of the games that they did. And I was one of the voices on Star Trek Enterprise in an episode called Kershara, which was great, but you don't get painted blue, so, you know, heck. <laughs> a missed opportunity. I really wanted the antenna, you know? <laughs> Uh, they're still, you know, making Star Trek. Several new Star Trek properties are coming out. And uh, I guess we have to talk about the fact that there's a new Bebop coming out. One of the reasons we're doing this podcast is to start speculating about what that could be. And we're curious, uh, what are your feelings about Cowboy Bebop being made live action or anime being redone like this in general? Live action versions of anything of this nature are almost by definition difficult. They can be done, but they're really, really, really tricky, and you have to watch how you approach it. Anime has a very unique feel to it, and it's difficult to translate that to a live action environment and still maintain respect for the original. The people who are approaching it, I feel, need to have a genuine love of the original project, the way it looked, the way it affected people, even its little odd quirks. If they can get that and maintain a real feeling of respect for that, then they stand a chance, and I'm more than happy to see what somebody can arrange, what they can pull off with a new version of Cowboy Bebop. And thank you for bringing Bebop back through this podcast so that people who are listening will be encouraged to see the original before they see any other version. It makes a difference. And this is terribly self-serving. I think it would behoove the people doing it to bring some of the voice actors in and have them do cameos. <laughs> We've definitely speculated that a few times on the show, uh, which episodes will be translated into in episodes in the Netflix adaptation. And honestly, we believe you could play VT. We would love to see that cameo, if not an entire episode of you. So <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? No objections here, and I'm not going to dispute that analysis. It sounds perfectly good to me. <laughs> Actually, uh, I think that it really behooves the producers to think very, 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 very intensely over whether or not they're going to bring back the original voice actors. I think they should because the fans remember us, the fans related to us, or there wouldn't be another version coming up on Netflix. We are why. It happened for you guys. So, uh, and like I said, this is terribly self-serving, but I would absolutely love to come back in some form on that um, on that version. I would love to reprise VT. She was a riot to do. She's one of my favorite characters. She's a tough gal. And I would love to do it in any form that they required of me. VT especially is such a unique character and you have such a unique voice People are really going to be able to tell the difference if they go another route. So here's us vouching for you well, with whatever power we have. <laughs> thank you. And, and uh, just to anybody who's listening to the interview, it means a lot to producers when they hear from fans as to what they would like. I've been curious through this whole interview talking about sword fighting and archery and jumping out of airplanes, which we discussed uh, before the mics were rolling. Yes, and both of us lived. We did. We lived to tell the tale. <laughs> Have any of these things that you started for work turned into hobbies or passions that you carry with you now outside of work? Well, yes. I would say that I don't do skydiving anymore uh, just because <laughs> I've broken too many things. Oh, my. But uh, I've also worked with horses 
and done 50-mile endurance rides with horses. Uh, I've also been in the Tournament of Roses Parade on horseback four times. And that is a passion. Now, my horse passed on a few years ago, and my a good friend of mine who was a horse who I helped rescue just passed a while ago. So I'm sort of watching the end of an era, but there's always another era coming up. There's a transition that you make in your life from one magical phase to another. And there's always something new coming down the pike. I am looking forward to whatever's next. And sometimes you don't know. You don't see it coming. A new passion will arise. But there have been so many already. (laughs) I think Othello put it well. If it were now to die, it were now to be most happy. I don't intend to die. Be clear on that. (laughs) But I cannot say that I haven't tried a lot of fascinating things and gone a lot of fascinating places in my life. And there's always a new adventure down the road. That's really fascinating because in Cowboy Bebop, we find that our main character doesn't feel that way at all. Um, and it's through... Well, he's a cynic, isn't he? Yeah, he, he's kind of, he's got a death wish. It's pretty clear. Um, <laughs> But it's, I can hear that energy about, you know, having this love for life and this passion for new adventures. It seems exactly the kind of person that VT is. There's a little bit uh, in VT of bitterness and anger because of what happened with her husband. And how she feels about bounty hunters in particular shows that there is anger. Anger is an interesting thing. It can either make you dark and turn away from life, or it can push you, it can fuel you into a new direction in life. Um, I will put this into skydiver terms, (laughs) since Lauren and I shared that experience. Uh, They used to say when people were nervous training to go skydiving, they used to say, it's all right to have butterflies. You just have to learn to get them to fly in formation. And that's the same thing with anger and the darkness that comes with life experience that we all have. There isn't a person on this planet who hasn't had something in them that twisted them a little bit. You have to get that to fly in formation, and that takes character. You have to take your anger, your darkness, channel it into a positive direction. And that's the direction I think VT was going. I think... Running into Spike actually may have shown her how dangerous it was to hold on to the darkness. It can turn you bad. And I think she was going, okay, I see. He is where I could have gone. I'm on that road now. I'm headed down the dark road in a lot of ways. Maybe I need to rethink this. And that's where I'd like to see VT's character develop into, not that she turns into unicorns and puffballs. No, that's, that's, this is not our girl. But that she might lock down, use that anger to fuel forward momentum. And by doing so, help him. Now, that's where I'd love to have seen the characters develop if they had stayed alive, both of them. <laughs> Only one of us stuck around, Spike. Uh, <laughs> If they had maintained a relationship between the two characters in the original. As a divorced woman who is often angry, you have no idea how much your words mean to me today. But also, Uh point the second, uh, remember how before the interview you said you didn't want to speculate (laughs) about what was going to happen to characters you didn't write? I think we did it anyway. (laughs) Well, when you start down the dark path, (laughs) it will continue to draw you. Well, we have had... An incredible time with you today, Melody. Um, I know you revisited this episode before chatting with us. And so Mm -hmm. we had an extra question that we wanted to tack on that we asked each other to. And that is, if you were a space trucker like VT and the other characters in this episode, how would you decorate your truck? I believe I would decorate my truck like a Celtic warrior. Nice. Nice. With maybe just a touch of Klingon around the edge. (laughs) Oh, maybe a few scalps hanging there and there. there. Whoa. (laughs) 
And uh, the scalps would be the scalps of bounty hunters, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Watch it, Spike. I'm after you. <laughs> Is there anything we didn't get to touch on today or uh, any questions we didn't ask that you would like to share before we say goodbye? I'm still working in uh, video games a lot. There, And in video games in particular, we are restricted by non-disclosure agreements. But I will say that if you listen carefully in several projects that are well-known that I cannot name, you will hear my voice coming up, yes. I would like to throw a little nod towards one of my favorite characters from the past, which was from a um, <laughs> a project with two names. We called it Technoman. Techoman Blade is what it came out as. I was sword in that. I don't know if you remember that, but... One thing I loved about that was the the sadness. She was a, another tough gal, another fighter, another warrior, and all of that, but she was deeply in love, unrequited love, and it eventually took her life. Gosh, that's cool. That's never been used before in drama, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just loved playing her because for all that she was a bad girl, you ended up relating to her because of the sheer sadness of her situation. That happens to all of us sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> we we often refer to the show as the Spike Spiegel sad show. So um, <laughs> these have been themes that we've definitely touched upon and will over the next two dozen episodes we have to record. But Melody, it was a pleasure speaking with you today. This was so much fun. Well, I enjoyed it too. You took me on some very interesting roads I didn't think I was going to travel. The stakes get extremely high near the end of this episode. The Linus mines are collapsing, and driving in there with a truckload of nitro is just a potential disaster that could kill everyone. Of course, our heroes get caught in there. The untimely demise of Decker happens pretty early on. Yeah. He's, already, <laughs> he's already dead at the climax of the episode. So long. <laughs> so long. You are not missed. We do not mourn you. It does It does raise our bounty count to like 0 for 9, I think you wrote down. It is. It, they have gotten zero bounties. I don't know how they're eating at this point. They sure managed to get a huge ice cream, though. <laughs> maybe, she, maybe she charmed her way into that. I don't know. I will say this episode, though, she's on the ball. She manages to find Decker, even though she's got the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> and she does get the truck description, and she does extract the nitro with the clamps on the front of her Zipcraft. And yet she still manages a line that's, quote, easy for you to say, Mr. Perfect, when Spike is demanding that she puts the nitro into his monopod. Yeah, they're kind of jerks to each other in this episode. Jet tells Faye he wishes her mouth was broken, Oof. and I was really against that. Uh, the immaturity and occasional sexism of Jet and Spike, I'm noticing a lot more this walkthrough. Jet's relegated to the mechanic role this entire episode. I don't feel like he adds much overall. I will say, though, that some of the mechanic work seems to be pretty dangerous, given that there's a radioactive symbol behind him in the hangar he's repairing repairing these ships. The mechanic work he does is nothing short of miraculous, because especially when he's in with the red tail, he is surrounded by tiny pieces of rubble and garbage just broken off of the ship. I, I wonder how much of that, though, is just needing to get the job done versus being a crack mechanic and it's aces at your job. One other thing that Jet does is try to feed bean sprouts to Ayn. And as a dog lover, I checked, can you feed bean sprouts to a dog? Yes, you can. They are nutritious. Ayn just has a uh, more discerning taste. <laughs> also, Judgy Cat is judgy. Can I mention that Zeros has some kind of intellect too this episode? You know, just kind of reading the room and telling VT essentially to lay off Spike. He's not that bad. Yeah, and isn't it funny that Zeros chooses Spike when Spike is on record saying he hates animals? 
and cats specifically <laughs> later in the show. Uh, Spike does get a huge moment of daring do in this episode in which he puts in earplugs, holds his breath, and jumps out into the vacuum of space without a suit. And you know I can't just let this stuff go. <laughs> I, I have to know if it's possible. According to space.com, which uh, is a site that did a really nice job dispelling some rumors about outer space, like I had heard you would explode. (laughs) Apparently that's not true. Space.com says your skin does a great job of keeping your insides inside. So rumors of your blood boiling or your body exploding are false. However, there's a grain of truth in there. For one, the nitrogen in your bloodstream and the oxygen in your lungs will expand. So Spike actually did the total wrong thing, (laughs) taking in a big breath, because if his lungs were already full, the oxygen expanding could have ruptured his lungs. So in theory, if this happens to you, you should breathe out. My dude, do not hold your breath (laughs) in space. The other effects that you would experience immediately, you'd be hit with a great deal of UV radiation that could burn you and also affect your DNA or cause cancer. And you will lose consciousness in as little as 15 seconds without oxygen going to your brain. That won't kill you. It takes a solid two minutes for your organs to shut down. (laughs) Uh, But This is crazy. This is a crazy thing I'm about to say. It's a nightmare. Apparently, on December 14th, 1966, a man named Jim LeBlanc accidentally became the only human to survive space-like conditions. NASA dressed Jim in a moon suit and then put him in a triple-doored vacuum chamber. The pressurization hose to his body was disconnected and nobody knew about that. So he was... (laughs) I know. (laughs) So he was exposed to space-like conditions. The saliva on his tongue boiled, and he passed out in 14 seconds. Oh, my God. (laughs) He did, however, survive. Uh, I'm not going to get into some animal testing that NASA did. There was, there's some cruelty in the past of NASA, but animals can also survive in space for less time. Uh, The other science thing that we see is Spike uses his gun to propel himself. Guns can, in fact, fire in space because modern ammo has its own oxidizer, so there is no oxygen required to fire the gun. Thanks to Newton's third law of motion, that pushback would happen, but probably not as quickly as Spike was moving, so that was an exaggeration. And lastly, there is no sound in space, so we should not have heard the gunfire. (laughs) (laughs) Lauren, I think I have new nightmares to dream. Thank you. (laughs) I do too, but I needed you to experience them with me. I could not suffer that alone Uh, anymore. uh... (laughs) So, like, the thing is, some of that stuff is real, but he would have passed out before being able to do any of it. And our guy probably had some longer-term effects, which are not great. Uh, Something that's not cool, in my opinion, uh, is that Spike didn't keep the money. He destroyed his ship twice. Faye has a destroyed ship. The Bebop hasn't eaten in presumably weeks or has only eaten bean sprouts. And yet Spike only takes, what, a thousand Wulongs from the stack. Yeah, I don't even think that. I thought it was like 300, but I was so pissed at him because it's not like, it's not like VT didn't sign up for this. VT had this bet going. And in my opinion, she's been waiting for this moment. You know, she's been waiting to know who's the person who's finally going to crack this. And she wasn't spending the money because she was ready to give it away. I don't know what Spike was trying to do, but I can't get behind it. Other people, you have a family to feed, Spike Spiegel. That's all we have this week on the Bebop Beat. Thank you so much for listening. And once more, we so appreciate our two guests, Melody Spivak and my dad, Bob Rapsiak. We talked to both of them a little bit about being a space trucker and what that might be like. So before we go, Jamie... I want to ask you just one thing. 
If you had to decorate your own truck, what would you decorate it with? Gudetama. Lazy egg (laughs) everywhere. (laughs) I think mine is Pokemon, but Pokemon is very wide. Uh, It's a huge decades-long fandom. And so I'd probably pick something very specific, like an Oddish-themed truck, and I would have just that little cute guy with no arms and his little plant head all over my truck in various forms, including live plants. I think making an Oddish theme to include some real greenery would be super cute and would make me smile all the time. (laughs) I mean, when your trip is four days to and from Venus, like... Yeah, you got to enjoy that. <laughs> I wonder if I could if I could bring my dog cuz VT brought her cat somehow with her and those looked like huge trucks. I think I'd want to give Junebug her own little compartment. I so there's a scene where Ayn is just floating in 0 G and his legs are flailing and that's how I picture Junebug, <laughs> just all legs flailing everywhere. <laughs> she is. She's got She's got spaghetti noodle legs. I don't think I've gotten to share a picture of her yet on the Instagram, and there is our excuse. (laughs) Next week, we'll be talking Waltz for Venus with Eddie Doty. Eddie is a new friend to the show, and he is an expert in a ton of things. Not only is he a film editor for some geek properties that you've probably heard of, but he also knows Jeet Kune Do and is a firearms expert. So we have a lot to say to him. Excellent. I can't wait to talk to Eddie. And I hope you join us next week, listeners, for another episode of the Bebop Beat. Thank you for listening to the Bebop Beat. If you like our show, please rate us on Apple or wherever you find your podcasts. Find us on Instagram and Twitter at Bebop Beat. Our email address is beboppeatpodcast at gmail.com. The Bebop Beat is hosted and produced by Jamie Sanchez and Lauren Fates. Our editor and associate producer is Angela Geis. Our logo and art assets are by Kat Janda. You know, they're good people. They're, they're the, four, uh, the 18-wheel cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a good place to end it.